Today I figured it's time for a follow up video on my HP 86. Now if you're not familiar with the backstory on my HP 86, about 6 months ago I replaced all of the original key stems with brand new 3D printed replacements. I detailed the entire disassembly, design, testing, and final installation process in a two part series about 6 months ago. Now for the most part these 3D printed keys have held up pretty well and I haven't really had any problems with them. Well until recently that is. Now if you haven't seen the original two videos which you might want to check out because it was a really cool process. The original key stems have a problem where after time the plastic gets brittle and it starts to crack in the sides. This would cause the keys to stick when you pressed them down all the way. So what I did is create a 3D printed replacement piece for this and that one shouldn't split because the way that the layers are printed and it has this really large top lip so it should be extra strong. Well at the very end before I decided on the final design I'd made one more choice. I had altered the pieces so they could be easily removed from the stem because the original parts cannot be removed due to the flat side on the latch mechanism and you have to desolder the entire keyboard and it is a massive, painful, long process to get the key stems out if you have the original ones in. So my new parts were meant to be removable from the front. But over time there has proven to be some pros and cons with that. On the one hand, I can now work on this keyboard without having to desolder all of it, but on the other hand, the little nub here that holds the key stem in place has failed on a couple of the keys and they just get popped out by the spring. So today we're going to take a look at updating the design with a new model and replacing all of the key stems that I have in here right now. Alright so there are two changes I want to make to the design here. One of them's pretty obvious. I'm going to make the bite a little bit bigger for the tabs that hold the key stem in place. So let's go ahead and do that first. And the other thing I want to do is actually inside the keycap so if we look down in there we'll see that I have this kind of octagon shape cut out of everything but along the edges of the inside there is this line here that and that was part of how I solved the holes printing in the side walls of the key stem so that is kind of required well the entire piece in the middle here is printed without supports and it's kind of unreliable. So what I want to do is take that inner wall and make it just a little bit taller. And what that will do is make the printer have to print a separate line of plastic before it gets to these parts that are bridged. Now that isn't really technically bridged, it's just kind of an overhang. But this will give something for the bridged pieces to be put onto so it, it'll work out to be a little bit stronger. Every single one of these that I printed last time actually had some stringing pieces inside of here and I had to file all of them by hand before I could put them in the keyboard. It was an absolute nightmare. So I really want to avoid having to do that again and that should do it because this will just make sure everything goes where it needs to be. Alright so I'm going to go ahead and set Slicer to just print a hundred of these. <laughs> That's a lot. And uh, yeah, should be ready to go. One of the important things with how these are printed, I don't think I covered this in too well in the last one, last videos I should say, um, is how these are actually done. So I have my settings pretty carefully chosen over here so that it, the outer wall of the stem is just one line of plastic. I know I mentioned that, but it has to be like that the whole way through. And then here's where we have the outer wall and the inner wall. But uh, this part here, we can see there's a couple beads of plastic now before it gets to the bridging. So that's going to help that a ton. Um, but yeah, so the whole thing, it's really, it needs to be done in a particular way. So they have to be printed upside down. It's it's rather complicated. These <laughs> The settings have to be just right for these to actually work. These things are barely 3D printable. It You're really working within the maximum restrictions of what you can print with this part. But yeah, I think that's it. So uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and let that print run overnight.
All right, so some of these turned out just fine, and others clearly did not. I'm not 100% sure what happened there. Um, if we look at the Octolapse, as the print is going towards the end of it, the whole printer kind of shifts, and I'm not really sure what caused that. But after that, a bunch of the key stems from the back kind of just disappear. So I'm thinking that that caused the erroneous prints here. Now I did just do a lot of work on my 3D printer. I just replaced the bed leveling sensor with a touch version, and I had to redo a lot of the wiring for that. So I just went ahead and redid all of the wiring as a safety precaution. So I, I may not have it fully dialed back in yet, but it was pretty close. But anyway, I'm gonna have to reprint some of these. I printed 100, but I need 91, and I lost more than what it looks like here, so I'm gonna have to go and get some more printing. All right, the print is going along nicely on the 12 new key stems. And while that's going, I'm gonna go ahead and start pulling out all of the keys so I can get those new stems in. All right, so that's all of the keys out, but you may have noticed that there were a couple of black ones in there, and these are the new designs, but um, I was testing them out, and they really don't want to come out. Ooh, yeah, see, now that's starting to lift up there. So, yeah, I, I think these new ones really aren't going to be removable after they're put in there. Well, at least maybe not without great effort. Um, oh, that one feels like it might release. Ah, I don't know. But, um... Being removable isn't terribly important, so I'm not that... up. Oh, there we go. That one came out. Okay, so that's good. That's actually the same uh, design as the ones that are currently being put uh, in. So this one has a bite that's a bit bigger than these do, actually. So that's uh, why that one's just not going to cooperate at all. I don't think it's going to want to give me... Uh, oh. That's less than desirable. I may have to take that one out now. Hmm, fun. I wanted to avoid doing that because I'm afraid that this top, you know what, I'm just, I'm just gonna leave that one. Um, I'll put this on the key that goes there so it spaces it out correctly, but I don't want to take this one out um, or try and rip this out in case the layers separate <laughs> and then I'm left with a part of the key stem in there um, because then I will have to desolder the entire keyboard again. and. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to leave that in broken. I don't care. The rest of the stems are still printing. So while that's going on, I'm going to start removing the uh, stems from the keys themselves. All right, the new key stems just finished being printed, so it's time to start getting them in here. Um, yep, I am going to be using the installer tool like I did last time. It just makes it so much less likely to damage the contacts inside of here, and I assume I'm not going to get away with no finishing on these parts, so I have a file ready to go as well. Well, great. It does look like I am going to have to uh, sand every single one of these. Fun. Okay, the amount of time to do this is on the magnitude of hours, not minutes. So you're just going to have to miss this part because I'm not going to record three hours of footage or whatever it takes me to do this. Okay, this is... One pretty hate machine later, and I've got 27 keys in here now, not including the one that was already in there. And I figured I would show you exactly what I have to do um, with how these failed, because I actually had to psych myself up to do this video this time, because I had to do this last time as well, and remembered how much it sucked. So, here's what I'm actually having to do to get these in. Okay, here we have one of the printed key stems. All the layers are nice and smooth across. It's consistent going down the sides. There's no real apparent problems. 
unless I flip it over. In which case you can see that side looks a bit gnarly. Now what's going on here is when it's moving from part to part on every single one of these, it's leaving a bead along two corners, one at the bottom and one at the top. Now when you print one of these, you don't have that problem because the extruder goes from one layer and then just moves slightly up and goes immediately to the next layer. But when you're printing multiples of these, it has to keep jumping back and forth between the pieces and the extruder will retract a little bit of plastic and put it back down, at least I have to or else the stringing here gets even worse on this print. So it's just, it's a, a really big problem when you're trying to print multiples of these. And I was afraid this was going to happen. I was really, really hoping it wouldn't happen with this plastic or this would be minimal or I'd tweak my settings. I'd, it happened, so, so it would be it. Now this problem is actually why I ultimately never sold these even though I said I was considering it. It would just take too much time to be able to sand every single one of these before I send them out, or it would be too big of a burden to expect someone who purchased these from me to be able to uh, sand them themselves. So just, yeah, that that's not meant to be. So here's what I have to do for every single one of these. I have to take it, look at it, see that it is just those two sides that are really that bad. These sides can sometimes be blotted with the little specks it can form, but most of the time they're good. And from here, I just have to file it down until the corner is smooth enough that it's not going to catch inside the slot. It's not fun. It takes forever. I have to do this for all of the keys. The whole print, well not printer, computer. And it's at least two corners on every single one of them. And once it looks like it's good, I inspect it. That one can use a little bit more on that side. All right, and then when I think it's good, it's time to actually put it in the computer, which is a hair raising enough process by itself. So I have to feed the install tool in there, take my sanded part and a spring, put the spring on first and then align the sanded part. Although now I can look in there, I can see a couple little strings in there. So what I'm gonna have to do is take the other one of these, kinda just break those free from inside so they can't catch in between the contacts. There we go, that looks better. Now I can align this on the correct side, feed it down, and now I get to find out if I sanded it enough. And in this case, I did. So that's the entire process that I have to do for every single key on here. Yeah, this sucks. Oh, that's the last one. Which means that once again, all of the stems in the keyboard are 3D printed. Now I just have to uh, go back and put all the keycaps in. I don't really need to test them before I put the keycaps in to see if they work, because, well, it's pretty easy to see that they work. If the two metal contacts inside touch after you depress the key, they're good to go. And every single one of these keys, you can see the two contacts touching. So. They should all be working just fine. All right, so now I'll just start getting the keycaps on. Okay, so I'm almost all done. The majority of the keys here are nice and happy. There's just six here that are sticking. I'll have to pull those out and file them some more. <laughs> it, uh, you want to know something funny? I forgot that after whatever the last video it was that I worked on a keyboard, I actually bought key pullers. So uh, yeah, I guess I can use these to try and get 
these out. Yeah, that's slightly easier. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just gotta remember to actually use these in the future, because, wow, yeah, that makes a big difference. And there we have it, the three remaining keys all fixed. And as you can see on screen, I went through and tested every single one of the keys, and they're all working. So the keyboard is back to being good as new-ish. I mean, see, it, the keys aren't super level, um, just because of how the 3D printing is kind of uneven, but does it, it doesn't really matter. So, you know, I'd take this over the keys that originally just stuck down and wouldn't come back up any day. So, you know, this has its drawbacks. It's not for everyone, but it's worth doing if you really want to use one of these or any other computer that has the stack pull or high tech switches. It's such a shame you can't just pull the original key stems out through the top. I mean, the real problem is the lip on there. You can see how that's just totally flat. It makes it just impossible to do that. It's just annoying because one individually printed key stem looks like this and printed in batch looks like this. Clearly, this one's a sloppy nightmare compared to this one, and that's why you have to file off these rough corners that develop. An individually printed one, it just goes layer to layer, one after another, and the whole thing looks very good. I mean, there's a little bit of, you know, inconsistency on the other side, but still, it's way better than that one. These don't have to have anything done to them. When they're printed individually, they just fit right in. The whole problem is because of those retraction lines that develop on the sides of the stem during printing multiples. Perhaps a belt bed printer would work very well for this because you could just print one after another and have them fall off the edge of the belt. I'm even almost considering trying to put a plow on my extruder and see if I could print one of these at a time and then just ram it off and then print another one. These take about seven minutes to print each, and it would just be too much effort to sit there and every seven minutes have to remove one of these for 91 of these. You might be able to fit 10 of them on a build plate and have them print individually one at a time, but really the extruder, whole, the whole mechanism for the hot end is just too big to be able to really print these one at a time on the print bed. Maybe if you had a just a uh, Bowden extruder, so you had only the hot end on there, it could work, but I I don't know, I, I don't have that, so I haven't been able to experiment with that. Now, for me, it doesn't really matter how much effort it's going to take to work on the keyboard or any other part for this computer, because this is one of my favorite vintage computers I have. So, whatever effort I need to put in to keep it going, I am going to do. And that's pretty much it for repairing the keyboard, so let's check out a cool thing you can do with this computer. Now, as I said in the first video for this uh, little series on the keyboard, this is perhaps the most proprietary computer I own. The disk drive has a unique interface. The monitor has overscanning, or underscanning actually, to fit more information on the display. The CPU is totally proprietary for HP. I believe the codename is Capricorn, and there's a interesting story in there involving Steve Wozniak and kind of the seeds that created Apple, but that's for another day. One of the things about the CPU being totally proprietary is that it was very difficult to convince developers to write software for this computer. So most software was created and published by HP for this computer including games. This is actually for the 85, which is a 40 column version of this. The games don't run quite well, but close. But everything went through HP to get on here. And there are very few examples of third party software that will actually run on this. One example here would be VisiCalc though. So if you wanted to program software directly for this computer, it was quite the burdensome task. However, HP recognized this limitation and came up with an interesting solution. The CPM system cartridge. Now, what's actually inside of this is a complete Z80 computer. Kind of weird, huh? Now, you can connect this into the back and then you can use the Z80 contained within this cartridge to run CPM. So, let's go ahead and try that out. I'll go ahead and put the CPM system cartridge in the slot just above the memory expansion. 
All right, now that the CPM cartridge is in there, I'll go ahead and put the CPM disc into the drive connected to interface zero and fire up the computer. And there we have it, CPM running off of the Z80 cartridge plugged into the back of the computer. Pretty cool, huh? Now, this all gets more complicated from here because the CPM formatted disks for this computer are totally different than the HP Basic formatted disks, and you can't use the same files between them. There are transfer programs to allow you to migrate the files from one operating system to the other, and I do have some of those, but I haven't tried them all that much. So, I can't really say how well that works, but it's... The whole thing's really weird. With the CPM system in here though, that would give you the option to go to a store and get a regular boxed CPM application and be able to run it on your HP 86. So it was a really cool feature to add. This didn't really help this thing gain any market share though, even though it's a really interesting feature. Perhaps they should have gone with an 8086 cartridge to allow you to run Microsoft DOS instead. That might have gotten them some more headway. But anyway, it's an interesting look at the HP and my keyboard repair. I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time. Hmm, that's kind of strange.